hello in this video we are going to talk about the astrology and psychology of the love triangle between uh, Charles Sturd, uh, his current wife and his former wife uh, Princess Diana and we're going to try and explain his choice and why even though most people like Diana better than Camilla um, he actually uh, chose Camilla and we're going to take a we'll, we're going to try to take an intimate look into uh, why he feels more compatible with Camilla than with Diana even though for most people Diana is more appealing and charming and we're not doing this because we're particularly interested in any of the three of them, but we're doing it because we're interested in just taking a deep dive into the psychology of intimate relationships. And what is it that, that, that says, oh, this is my person? We're taking a look at uh, this particular celebrity triangle. And also in my previous videos, I've spoken about different celebrity couples, not from the celebrity perspective, uh, I'm not doing this because I'm particularly interested in the celebrities themselves, but because um, this is a way for us to learn something about our own lives. And um, uh, this knowledge can help guide us when we choose our own intimate partners. So take uh, this video as a lesson in, um, in building stable relationships, in recognizing solid relationships, rather than necessarily oh you know it's about the celebrities themselves that said um, um this video is divided in four parts in part one we're going to talk about charles and his chart and his psychology as well as his um, personal and emotional needs as per uh, his natal chart and then we're going to talk about diana and then we're going to talk about camilla uh, and in the last part uh, i'm just going to make some final comments and observations so let's get started so Charles was born on the 14th of November 1948. He is Scorpio Sun, Taurus Moon and Leo Rising. Right there we see a lot of fixity in his natal chart. So this is somebody who once they settle on a course of action, it is unlikely that they're going to change that course of action. Uh, very often this is referred to as being stubborn and is something that is associated with uh, the sign of Taurus but it's more about the modality of the signs. He has his big three all in fixed signs and fixed signs are, they occupy the essence of every season. We have them when nature is systemically the same, every day the weather is the same. And so there is predictability, there's consistency about weather patterns which builds up the kind of character that likes stability and long-term commitments. These are not the kind of people, people with a lot of fixed placements are not the kind of people that you can get them to do anything because they think long and hard before starting something, before committing to something. And then once they do commit, it's kind of like it just goes on forever and ever. His son is in Scorpio in the fourth house. So Scorpios are known for their intensity, for their depth, for having a mind of their own and standing up to it. But this is an emotional water sign. In the end of the day, regardless of how scary or how powerful they look, all they, they perceive the world through the world, uh, through their emotions, through the filter of their emotions. And when that is in the fourth house, there is this um, double element of the inner world and of the fact that for this person, their identity will be very much linked to their family, to their ancestral karma, and that they will deeply value uh, family-like connections or personal commitments. And that extends to both his um, paternal or maternal family, so the family he comes from, but also it extends to the family you make in this own life. So family is not something that is a little bit of a side dish to the main personality. It is the core of the main personality. And so this is not somebody that will um, allow somebody else to dictate 
in the area of that fourth house of home and family because that is the core of your identity and because Scorpio is a sign that was originally ruled by Mars and Mars is about fighting for what you want and standing up for for yourself in first place whereas for some people uh, coming from a royal family or whatever family might not have a huge impact on the way they perceive their identity uh, of course, everyone's family leaves a mark on them, but not everybody feels that way. Not everybody recognizes it and not everybody um, perceives their experience of life and the world, their character, their personal relationships as having something to do, having been influenced by their family environment. With a certain fourth house, you are very clear about how important your family and your uh, familial connections are. And I'm using the term familiar connections because this is to encompass both the family you were born within, but also the one that you create. Whereas for some people, marriage might be a little bit of a business decision, a little bit of a more practical decision about who you associate with. And this is definitely something that you can very often see in that kind of like uh, royal circles or or um, important uh, economically powerful families where they marry um, sort of for networking purposes and out of convenience rather than necessarily for emotions. This uh, Scorpio Sun is really about your deepest sense of self being rooted in the family. And so for Scorpios, it's all personal. And so in this case, even though being part of the royal family is a little bit like, it, there is a business element to it for for Scorpio Sun in the fourth house, like this is all really very personal. There, there is like the business side of it is just never going to take prevalence over it. At the same time, we see that he has a moon in Taurus. And so having the moon in the 10th house usually means that you're going to be known for your emotions. Sometimes in the case of artists, um, this is... Um, a very positive thing because art comes from emotions it comes from your inner world and so having the moon there is usually a very good indicator that you're going to succeed in the art world because your emotions will it will be easy for you to channel your emotions more publicly and so it will be easy for you to gain recognition and popularity for your emotions on the more negative side uh, this could play out as you just being known for being overly emotional. The moon is exalted in Taurus. So this is a very good, like, it's a very potent place for the moon to be. But um, in his case, it kind of played out as him being known for matters of the heart. And again, it could be a positive thing uh, in the realm of arts, for example, or if you work uh, in humanitarian circles, where heart and then being soft and emotional matters. Uh, but in his case, I think it eventually played out a bit on the negative side because he became known for personal matters and for um, having um, moony and moody personal life. On the other hand, like I mentioned earlier, Taurus is a fixed sign, a solid sign, a sign of habits and stability. Taurus is like the mountain that's just, it's always going to be there. It's always been there. It will always be there. And of course, that's not true because people are not always there. But there's something about Taurus people that really gives off the feeling that they're just solid. And like, even if you've known them for, for two or three months, you just feel like they're always going to be there. Like you never expect that one day you're going to wake up and the mountain is just not going to be there. This is how strong at the same time, it could be misleading the feeling that that that's that person that presence that solidity is always going to be there but with the moon there it suggests that it is more likely that his feelings will be solid the moon is moody and changing and changeable but at the same time taurus is a sign that does not change they do not like change choose a course settle on it and just keep going so there is a clear indicator here that he he would not be changing partners so that he would not be unsure about what he wants or what he feels. But it could also indicate that he will be known for, for, for making decisions based on the heart, 
for the heart taking prevalence over the mind. Because that the, the, the moon is our inner world, it's our feelings, and in the 10th house, that's kind of what it means. And there are certain areas of human activity, like for example, the arts or humanitarian pursuits, where this is a good thing, it can be beneficial, and then there are areas where you would prefer that, that it wasn't so much in your face and so much on display um, how somebody is allowing the heart to lead them rather than the mind. His first house is very interesting. He has an ascendant in Leo and then Pluto, the modern ruler of his sun sign, is also there. It's not conjunct the ascendant, but it's still in the first house. So it's still pretty powerful. Now, Leo is the sign of the king. It, there's something about Leo's that comes with the message, I'm important. I matter. I don't even need to explain why. I don't need to give reasons why. I'm just important and I just matter. In a certain way, sometimes there's something about people with strong um, Leo influence that they come across as being very, very sure. Never ever even doubting the importance and the significance of their place in the world without necessarily other people understanding why that is. Even, even when you are clearly um, in, in a difficult situation, even when you are in a situation of sort of a beggar, even if you are in the situation of clearly having fallen from grace and clearly needing help, whenever there is a strong Leo influence or sometimes even Aquarius influence, um, there's those people never come across as acknowledging um, their lesser position in life. Like, to put it bluntly, they always come across as arrogant, even if they don't mean to. There's just something about them that commands this royal... Even the way they speak, the way they carry themselves, it's just, it oozes that sense of, I am important without necessarily having to explain why or without even knowing why or without having reasons or needing to define reasons. I just am. And in a sense, this belief in I am, I matter, is kind of typical for all fire signs because they are the signs of self-confidence and self-esteem and drive and passion to go after what you want. But with Leo, there is that clear element of I take pleasure in knowing that I am really, really important. On a more everyday level, there's just something about Leo Risings that makes them come across as being very royal without them having to even try. It's kind of like this whole I am important beyond any need to explain why, be beyond any need to gain importance or solid ground for the recognition that I think I'm entitled to. This attitude kind of oozes through everything. They just carry themselves around and it's easy to sort of convince other people that you are like that. There is an element of, oh, like they come across as a bit too arrogant. But then again, you, that's exactly what you would expect from kings and queens, right? You would expect them to be arrogant. But the element of self-entitlement, kind of like, of course I'm the king, of course I will be arrogant, of course you are beneath me. Like, there's, there's a bit of that element that can be a bit strong with, uh, with a lot of legal, or very powerful Leo placements. And of course, this would be even further strengthened when you are actually a king. Like, this is, when you're actually a king, that's like a carte blanche for you to really, really embody that Leo rising energy. But there's Pluto there. And so Pluto is a planet that is, mm, a planet associated with psychoanalysis, with power struggles, with seeing and knowing the essence of things, with being very, very familiar, very, very deeply just born with the understanding of the fact that life is about power and control. And so having that in the first house could indicate that this is somebody who is going to spend a lot of time in a situation where they're going to be quite visibly engaged in some sort of power struggle. 
And this could be like, for example, the way that um, the media was saying how Charles is basically waiting for his mother to die so he can be a king, but then he's gonna have to wait like really long time because Elizabeth II just happened to have a very long life. And so he was in this situation where he wants to have power, but he can't have it. And so he's clearly at a disadvantage. So that was kind of a little bit part of the public perception about him. And then also uh, when he was cho well he when he was choosing or forced to choose his first wife there was also that element of him having lost control because um the general narrative that is accepted by the public and the press um is that he actually kind of had feelings for Camilla and he wasn't really certain that he wanted to marry Diana even at the very early stage of their engagement but in a sense I guess he lost the power over it and then he tried to regain it by just continuing moving on with his romance with Camilla even though he was married to Diana so of course as a Scorpio son he's not going to give up and he's not going to allow other people to dictate personal matters for him but at the same time with that powerful Pluto in the first house there's going to be um, some power struggle around you being allowed to align your life um, in the way that you want because remember the first house is important because it basically all the other houses all the other areas of your life line up after the first house they line up in according they take their respective places um, in accordance with the tone set by the first house and so when you have Pluto, so power struggles in the first house, there's going to be a power struggle about how you arrange your life. And so Leo, by the way, is ruled by the sun. And so the sun is actually his chart ruler and the sun is in the fourth house. So everything about his life will be lined up in accordance with family matters, in accordance with the matters of the heart. And we see that and, and, it, and it isn't something unusual for kings and queens and monarchies to of course everything will be lined up according to um, the way you um, according to your family but it's interesting that we also see it in his chart Pluto can also indicate very intense and powerful emotions and when they're in the first house there is some, a level of intensity about this person when you meet them that is really noticeable and Pluto intensifies whatever it touches. And so when Pluto is in Leo and in the first house, there is um, a bit of intensification of egoism. It's not a very politically correct way to put it, but Leos are all about all eyes on me. This is about the self. Leos are ruled by the sun, the identity. My identity is the core of everything. That is, that is the Leo approach to life. It is a very self-affirming approach, which is the positive way to say that, that it's egoistic. I mean, we're talking about the same thing, but it's just the positive way to put it and the negative way to put it. So there's a, a, a very strong element of self-affirming, which is also what we see with Aries and with Sagittarius to some extent, um, the fire signs. But Pluto in Leo and in the first house intensifies that feeling that I am the king, I'm the omnipowerful person. There is a bit of a the flair of a dictator, so to put it. And we can see how it seems like much of his future, once he is officially coronated as a, as a crowned as a king, um, much of what he will have to deal with will be uh, what Meghan and Harry are doing. And so that's also a form of power struggles. So that element of power struggle will continue to be part of his destiny and part of his identity. So far, it was kind of like a power struggle between him and his mother because he was the one that was uh, kind of like having to wait for too long. The one who was seen as being uh, disempowered, he wasn't able to choose his first wife. He had to wait for a long time under the heavy shadow of a woman that was... Um, very talked about, very liked, very respected. And a woman compared to whom he 
kind of looks like he's not as good as she was because she portrayed she projected that image of being really responsible um, towards realizing the, the heaviness of her duty and the, the historic responsibility of her role. Whereas him, because of his personal matters, because of that moon in the tent house, he's more known for, um, well, for, for being, a, a, letting emotions take over, letting personal matters take over, which usually does not command the same respect in society as if uh, you appear to be really, uh, cool-hearted and rational, benevolent, kind, yes, but still not emotional, very grounded, very stable. So in many ways that power struggle between him and his mother was about um, how could he ever measure up to the respect that she commanded? Because he's already quite well into his life, he already has some years behind him, and there's been a lot that has been uh, published and said and written about him, and it's usually not, uh, usually nobody shows him the same respect that, that they were showing to Elizabeth II. So there is that power struggle. And then when we turn to his uh, life forward, we also see that there's going to be um, probably a continuous power struggle with Meghan and Harry about all the ways in which they will try to um, create a bad image of the monarchy and the, the ways in which he will probably decide to fight back. Whether that would be openly and directly, or a bit more behind the scenes. We see Mars, the modern ruler of his sun sign, in the fifth house of romance, creativity, and fun. And in many ways you can see how this, is, this has really been the way his life looks on the outside for pretty much all the time, because he has been mm, known for his romantic endeavors. Uh, well, he is known for having that uh, triangular marriage and, and romances and adultery and all of that. Uh, he has been known for, for not having to work that much. Um, I mean, kings these days don't really work that much, and especially him, he hasn't been working that much, considering that Elizabeth uh, had a long life and did much of the job for a long period of time. So if you just take a step back and you think about what's your general impression of the life of Charles, you probably feel that um, his life has been pretty much fifth housey. It's been, um, you know, it's all about uh, no commitments, but like no, no serious commitments, just fun. Um, romance, also gambling. Uh, well, what, what I mean by gambling is, for example, the fact that he uh, apparently took money from the um, Osama bin Laden Foundation or the, the Osama bin Laden family. So there is that um, politically incorrect way of, of earning money, which is technically what the fifth house is about when we talk about gambling. In that same fifth house we also have Jupiter, in the final really critical degrees of Sagittarius and Jupiter rules over Sagittarius so it's very well placed there but it is in an opposition to Uranus which is in Gemini also a very good placement so to speak because Uranus is the higher octave of Mercury and Mercury is the sign is the planet that rules over Gemini so these planets are both at 29 degrees that's uh, they're very potent and very powerful in there. This is where that energy is really taken to critical degrees. And so Jupiter in Sagittarius is about expansion internationally. It's about largeness of fifth house matters, whether that's going to be international or more globalistic approach to money gambling or just having fun. And that opposition to Uranus suggests that there's going to be something erratic and something crazy, unusual, non-traditional about fifth house matters. Potentially something from the area of networking, which is what the 11th house is about, networking and all these people that are on the same level as us in the same industry. So in his case, in the same royal aristocratic circles will have an impact on 
um, love children creativity romance and shared finances all the things that jupiter rules in his chart so the fifth house is also associated with children and we have this um opposition from Uranus suggesting that there's going to be a bit of an upheaval with the children potentially an upheaval that's going to come from those aristocratic circles that I mentioned earlier that that represent his 11th house it's also interesting that Uranus is kind of at the cusp of that 11th house and the 12th house which suggests that much of this is going to come a bit out of the blue and a bit unexpected and because Jupiter is at the cusp of the 5th and the 6th house there is an indication that um, this upheaval that's going to start with children might eventually transfer to sixth house matters such as health, also co-workers. This cusp position of Jupiter kind of carries the influence of that calamity and that chaos uh, in between the two houses. So it's going to be it's probably going to start as something from the area of children, fun, creativity, but then it's going to spill over to sixth house matters such as health or co-workers. He has Saturn in the second house. Saturn is about limitation, about a wound. Whatever Saturn falls in our chart, this is where we experience difficulties and just this is where we consistently have to um, improve our situation step by step. We need to be strategic about this uh, sector of our lives. And this is where we might feel deficient even though there's technically no need to. So this deficiency, it could be perceived, but it could also be real. And it's very often that, you know, as above, so below. If you perceive yourself as deficient, then you end up being deficient and vice versa. So it is in his uh, second house of self-esteem and finances. Much has been said about the monarchy and how um, they, they're constantly under attack from the press and from other um, political and just social players about the amount of money they spend. So there's probably going to be um, consistent focus on how much he spends and consistent examination by the public of his personal finances. Saturn rules over his sixth house of health and co-workers and his seventh house of partnerships. When the ruler of the sixth and the seventh house is in the second house, this could indicate that he is going to receive much of his money from co-workers or partners, which could indicate that this is a bit of a shady way of getting money for a king. But I'm more interested in the way that this Saturn in the second house could play out um, in the realm of his own self-esteem. We've already uh, talked about how about Pluto in the first house and how his life has been um, very much tinted by these power struggles. And so that Saturn in the second house suggests that he may not feel as good about himself as he, he comes across. With Leo rising, you probably carry yourself in a way that suggests that you're really pleased with yourself to the point where you can't imagine what more magnificent human being you can be. I mean, obviously, this is a really extreme example, but it's possible considering the fact that he grew up as a king. So all of that, Leo, not every Leo rising is like that. But when you're actually a king, obviously, you will grow up with with magnified qualities of that sign but with Saturn in the second it suggests that he may not actually feel that good about his own self-esteem and that is because of um, the, the whole situation with Diana the fact that he is constantly engaged in power struggles the fact that the press sees him as less um, deserving than his mother the fact that he's being attacked uh, by uh, Megan, who is a former B-rate actress, and now all of a sudden he has to live in the situation where her word is kind of more powerful than his word. And in many ways, um, 
just so contemporary society is more likely to side with her and with her experiences than it is likely to side with him. And that goes for both contemporary society, but also with the press and also uh, many of the, the, the people who are in decision-making positions. Of course, other members of aristocracy will probably side more with him than with her, but then in the present day and age, his image, his career, his perception, all of this depends also on people who are elected for office, and these may not always be um, of the same mind as the aristocracy. So I already talked about how the, the power struggles have been so far present and will likely continue, and so I can see how that's going to put a bit of limitation on the way he can, he can build self-esteem and really feel comf confident in stepping into um, uh, the role. Mercury conjunct the south node in the fourth house in Scorpio to me suggests um, secret at inception. I don't have much to say about that because I think it's pretty obvious that when we talk about uh, kings and queens and their families, they're always things that we don't know. But, but Mercury in Scorpio is about deep, intense, emotionally honest communication, but it's also about secrets. And this energy is conjunct the south node, which is much about past life energies and past life karma, something that we are born with and that we should work on to move towards the direction of our um, north node. But none of this is surprising or unusual about kings and queens, so I, I don't have much to say about that. But notice how his north node, so the the future direction in which this current life will go, um, the north node is in Taurus, and Taurus is ruled by Venus, and his Venus is in Libra, conjunct Neptune and conjunct his IC. So the IC is the lowest, darkest, most intimate point in the sky, usually associated with the core family. Having the ruler of his north node conjunct the IC suggests that much of his destiny and of the direction of his life in this reincarnation will be associated with home and family matters, which is pretty typical for kings and queens. It's very good that um, Venus is in Libra, because Libra is it, one of its home signs, and so Venus is pretty well dignified there, and it is so it's very powerful, which is a very good indicator for um, the overall legacy that he's going to leave behind. At the same time, it's conjunct Neptune, the planet of religion, illusions, feeling good, also a planet of sacrifices. It's also associated with uh, drinking and alcohol and all sorts of escapist tendencies, also cinema and the visual arts. And so Neptune conjoined the IC indicates that there might be a sacrifice that he would need to do for the family, but also it could indicate escapism from that sacrifice, from the harsh realities that need to be faced in the area of home and family. Moving on to Diana, she was born on the 1st of July 1961, and she was Cancer Sun, Aquarius Moon, and Sagittarius Rising. So, we live in a world where men choose their women. And especially in the, the world of kings and queens, it is the chart of the men that defines whether a, a woman will get him or not. Um, I think we women very often just give ourselves to those men that, that demonstrate commitment, that demonstrate um, seriousness of intent, and honesty of feelings, and then it doesn't really um, matter whether or not we truly feel like he's our match. A friend of mine who is a psychologist, um, he's a colleague from a university, but he's been practicing for such a long time, and he told me that um, basically 10 years of practice as a psychiatrist have told him that women 
are the ones that are brought up to believe um, in the one, the special one. They're brought up to believe that they have to wait for that special one, that, that um, that's the whole purpose of their life, that there is a special one and that they will uh, meet him and that they should wait for him and that the only there's only one right man and that he will appear and that they need to stay committed to waiting for the for Mr. Right. Men, on the other hand, are brought up with more liberal understanding of relationships. They, they do not spend their lives fantasizing about meeting the one. Yet, in adult years, men are usually the ones that refuse to make any compromises about who they want and what they want. They are the ones that when they see someone, they instantly know if this person is the right one or not the right one. And if they like somebody, they could be with them for a very long time and they could be a good boyfriend. But at the same time, they're never going to delude themselves that this person is the one. Like they just know that that's not the one. And they could be with somebody knowing very well that this person is not the one. And then just, uh, but, but always staying true to their own understanding of who and what the one is. Whereas women, even though we are brought up with the understanding that um, we have to wait for that special one, we actually make compromises and give ourselves to other people that, that we don't necessarily feel are the ones, but they show us um, care, serious intention, love, etc. And so we end up trying to we end up being with them and trying to make it work even though we even though deep down we probably know that that's not exactly the one that's not the ideal relationship long story short women are more likely to make compromises with the ideal even though they were brought up believing that they should not and men who largely don't spend that much of their um young ears thinking about marriage or about um, their other half, they are actually the ones that actually they grow up in this world where, where they're being told that, uh, you, know, you know, women are kind of all the same. You can just like date one today and then just throw her out and then date another one tomorrow. And like, you know, they're, they're, they have this very, very liberal understanding about how you should treat women. Uh, but they are actually the ones that really, really stick to that most uh, pure feeling that, oh, this is the one. And I think this is relevant when we talk about Diana and about uh, Charles, because, so she has cancer son. It is very uh, well known that cancer and Scorpios get along well. These are both um, the kind of signs that look hard on the outside and then they're very soft on the inside. Scorpio and Cancer are a classic combo in the Zodiac. So it's not surprising that he saw somebody who is Cancer um, son and was in some way attracted to them and uh, there was a connection. Um, and at least on the level of basic appearances, there is a match. But we need to take a deeper look at Diana's chart. So she has an ascendant in Sagittarius. Well, Sagittarius is a freedom-loving sign of expansion. And she was, she was known for her love for freedom, but also for her international uh, travels, endeavors, and for the fact that she was popular just really all over the world. And she liked to travel and visit places far away from England. So... And then she also has a moon in Aquarius. And Aquarius moon is a, is a cool, rational moon. The moon is our inner world, it's our emotions. But when it is in Aquarius, it's not passionate. It is a lot more about communication and mental rapport. It's about mental partner, somebody who gets you on a mental level. Somebody that I look at them, they look at me and we know we're thinking the same thing. But it's not about passion and it's not about emotional need, emotional dependence and emotional um, connection. And if we go back to Charles's chart, well, intensity, emotional intensity, emotional commitment is exactly what Scorpios are after. 
Like they wouldn't understand somebody approaching personal relationships. Well, for Scorpios, everything is personal, but especially personal relationships are very personal. And so they wouldn't understand somebody approaching that with, with mental clarity and with cool, rational approach. Also, Pluto, the ruler of Scorpio, is in the first house, which also intensifies that need for deep commitment and for everything to be personal. And so fire and air signs are more about external expansionist energy. It's more about um, action and drive and love for life. It's also about love for mental flexibility, mental ideas, mental concepts than it is about the solid fixity of Charles's chart. Put it this way, if you're Charles, if you're somebody with his natal chart and his psychological constitution, and you see somebody like Diana, yeah, she is a Cancer son. So there is that um, first level of her identity that he would connect with. Because Cancer people are soft, they're vulnerable, they show compassion. And Diana was known for this because she traveled the world to show compassion and understanding and humanitarian pursuits and everything. Uh, we also see that um, there is a trine between her son and Neptune. So, yes, there is a tendency towards humanitarian pursuits and humanitarian work. But at the same time, Charles is... Scorpio's son. So he is in Pluto in the first house. So he's somebody who knows how to see beyond the first level, before beyond the facade, so to speak. And so beyond the facade, what you find is somebody with cool, rational, mental moon. So this is somebody who wants to build relationships on mental rapport, on shared love for ideas, for intellectual compatibility, not on passion or or emotions, be it physical passion with regard to like the bedroom or, or um, just emotional connection, just feeling like you're emotionally dependent on that person. And if that person leaves you, then you will just, m just mentally, physically, emotionally break down. This is the kind of relationships, the kind of intensity and passion that Scorpios want or just over like very, very Plutonian people want. And Aquarius is, is a really different energy. And also with Sagittarius uh, on the Ascendant, this is somebody who likes to build their lives um, around like Sagittarian, um, international, global, expansionist. Life has to be fun, it has to be interesting, uh, that kind of values. And so she, from her chart, she comes across as really freedom, expansion loving person, whereas Charles, See how much of his chart is really centered around the IC, around the fourth house of home, family, also children. And with that sensitivity towards power and control that we have with Pluto in his first house, it's very easy to see how uh, he's losing power over his wife. He's losing control over his wife because she's just very much uh, outgoing. She's just so much focused on the external world, on expanding life, life getting bigger, getting more interesting, involving more and more things, whereas he's more of a home private person. And he most certainly wouldn't want to lose the power over the narrative about the couple and to lose that control over the narrative about his marriage to his wife. And then at some point his wife was becoming more and more popular and even more liked than he was, which is again that activating that, that uh, problem with power struggle. In the first house, Pluto, he wants to be in control, he wants to feel in control, yet your wife is better known, more liked than you are, and she spends a lot of time traveling the world and winning the hearts and the minds of everyone, and there is that sense that you're being left behind. And this is not only on the level of external world, but also on the level of intimate connection. This is somebody who approaches you from a more mental perspective, somebody who um, their love language is about do we share the same ideas? Do we stimulate one another intellectually? Whereas his moon is in Taurus. It's all about stability and nurturing and predictability. It's all about fixed, uh, fixed, solid, quiet commitment. 
At the same time, Diana's son is in the eighth house, which is associated with uh, intimacy and um, in the sign of Scorpio. So this strengthens the, the point I made earlier about how when he sees her, he would, on first glances, it would be easy to um, kind of mislead yourself that she might be the right person. Because on some level, Yes, I mean, Cancer's son in the 8th house, there is that watery energy. Um, but once you get beyond this, and, and if you have a lot of Scorpio or Pluto placements, it would be easy for you. It wouldn't take too long to go beyond that and see that, that her, she lives her life and manages her uh, emotional relationships on a different basis. Also pay attention to the fact that her moon, which is in Aquarius, so it is an intellectual moon, is in third house, which is associated with the mind and with communication. That strengthens the idea that, um, that, that emotional stability, emotional content, feeling nurtured on an emotional level is tied to good communication, to good mental rapport. Notice her Saturn in the second house of self-esteem and um, finance, which is squaring her MC, telling us that she will come across to the public, to the general public, she will look as if she's restrained, that she is restricted on the level of her personal finances, but also on the level of her ability to truly blossom as a person because the second house is associated with self-esteem and so saturn in uh, is in capricorn which is the sign it rules it's very powerful there so this suggests that she less that she's going to have problems with her self-esteem rather she's going to feel fairly okay about about her self-worth and everything because saturn is is really well placed in in um in capricorn it's really powerful there but at the same time, that square to the MC suggests that to us, just um, a regular observers, it would look like she's being restricted and she's being kept, um, especially from, from somebody who is associated with her money and her um, personal possessions, the material foundation of her life. It's important to note that she is Cancer's son. And Cancer is ruled by the moon. So the ruler of her sun sign is the moon. And the moon is in Aquarius, in the third house. So that's a lot of association with communication and the mind and just mental ideas. At the same time, her ascendant is Sagittarius. Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter, which is also in the third house in Aquarius. So a lot of elements about her identity and just on every level, her professional, more everyday self, the way she strategizes about building her life, her emotional world, are all tied to Aquarius in the third house. And Aquarius is cool, it's rational, it's, it's really about mental rapport. Like, one of the things about, about romance with Aquarius people is that um, if there's somebody in this world who would refer to their girlfriend or boyfriend as just a friend, uh, they're likely to be Aquarius or to have like really strong Aquarian influence because they're the ones that are really doing their best to avoid um, that kind of commitment labels. This is the extent to which they really, really value their freedom. And I think that level of focus and love for freedom will come as a problem to pretty much every Scorpio because Scorpios are about commitment. It's about we are together from now until death do us part. And Scorpio is not the only fixed placement that Charles has. He has his big three all in fixed signs. But Aquarius is also a fixed sign. And you see how if you look at his chart, he's got Sun in Scorpio and then Ascendant in Leo and then moon in Taurus and then Diana comes to kind of fill in the blank spot in there uh, with all her just all the emphasis on um, on Aquarius and so it's kind of like plugging in the missing piece but that's not how it ends up working because she just has 
need for freedom that is too much for uh, for the role of uh, for the role of the wife of somebody uh, with that kind of level of desire for control and for, the, for somebody who is so plutonian notice how um, Jupiter so her chart ruler is in a square to Neptune and her son is in a trine to Neptune and so Neptune is associated with humanitarian endeavors and um, just altruistic pursuits and altruistic work and this is how she has been what she has been known for and what she has dedicated much of her life to now her moon is in an opposition to Uranus, which suggests that there's going to be upheaval and a bit of a chaos around her personal life and her, her emotions, her inner world. Emotions will be turbulent. And then because this is close to the nodes of the moon, that's potentially going to um, impact her whole destiny. Uranus is about reversals. So this is somebody who their heart took a decision and it took a course of action uh, with regard to your personal life and your, your private relationships. But then because there's Uranus in there, it, there is a likelihood that, that you will do a complete 180 and take a bit of a different path. And then it's, it's that reversal that will have an impact on your life because of the proximity to the nodes of the moon. Mars is also there, which indicates um, that this person will be a fighter. They will be, much of their life will be impacted by this drive to fight for yourself. But Mars is uh, close to the node of the moon, but it is in a different sign and it falls in her 10th house of career and public image. And with Mars there, um, it indicates an accident, it indicates a problem, it, it, it's the smaller malefic, so there's going to be something about the way she's perceived by the public that's not going to be fortunate. And Pluto in there suggests power struggles, that power struggle is what she will eventually be known for um, to the public. And I'm saying that because in her 10th house of Korean public image there's just nothing else after that Pluto so uh, that is the final way in which she will be known all in all the pile up of planets like Uranus which is reversal chaos Mars which is accident division and Pluto which is death rebirth transformation catharsis deep intense emotional experiences all of these planets suggest like turbulence and like really life-changing turbulence and all of them are close together between the close to her 10th house and also close to the north node which indicates that whenever a transit activates that cluster that she has in there um, this is potentially very volatile time for her and that volatility is in in an opposition to her moon so her emotions and then it's in a square to Venus, which is associated with money, but also relationships. So pay close attention to the nodes of the moon. The south node is the beginning. The north node is the direction in this lifetime. And so the south node, the beginning of the journey, is with a Uranian volatile intellectual moon. And then it passes through a square to Venus, so romance relationships, and then it ends up with a with that pile up of Uranus, Mars, and Pluto um, at the cusp of the ninth and the tenth houses. Notice also that her MC, so the top of the sky, really that one point in the sky that is really our most visible place, is in. Libra, which is ruled by Venus, and Venus is in Taurus, very well dignified, very well placed, but it is in the sixth house of accidents and illness. And also pay attention how her north node, so the, the future direction of her life, is in Leo, which is ruled by the sun, and then the sun is in the eighth house of associated with sex and death. 
and many other deeper esoteric occult psychological things but you know we all know how her life ended now let's go back to camilla and see why is it that she that he feels like she's a better match for him well she was born on the 17th of july 1947 and she is a cancer sun cancer moon and leo rising so um as i mentioned earlier um, scorpio cancer combos are a classic they have a lot in common they perceive the world through their emotions they uh have the, they share the same value for soft for for vulnerability for for relationships built on vulnerability and what well care for your vulnerabilities and providing a safe space for you to be vulnerable. For Scorpios, personal relationships are vulnerability and so they like to be with someone who is as vulnerable or even more vulnerable because yes, for them relationships are vulnerability but they like to be in control. They don't want to be vulnerable. They want to be in a relationship and they know that that's going to put them in vulnerable position and they hate it but at the same time they are a water sign they need the relationship and so it's the key to a successful relationship there is how do you manage to find someone with whom you can be vulnerable yet keep the control keep the sense of security taurus moon and so when your wife is out and about becoming more popular than you are and just being really freedom loving and having not enough, not as much as you had hoped uh, water uh, in her chart, then that can be a problem. And if you're somebody who has decided to fight for uh, your own self and for your own dream life, then that's not going to be really the kind of wife that you would settle for meanwhile look at camilla's chart so she has sun in the 12th house and her moon is also in the 12th house which indicates that uh, that she is more internal person the 12th house is a house associated with hidden places such as hospitals prisons um mad houses as well but it can be really also just living really really behind the scenes it could also indicate that you spend much of your life as being the, the the mistress the hidden love interest of someone there's something about your identity about the way you live your life um, that, that's going to be pretty hidden in her case um, her moon is conjunct venus venus is a planet that's associated with relationships and just love and romance in general and in her chart it rules her 10th house of career and public image but it's also the ruler of her ic which is about family so there's going to be something about her inner world and her personal relationships and her soulmate connections that's going to combine her career legacy house and also her home and family life the north node of the moon which is the future point of destiny is um in gemini and gemini is ruled by mercury which is also in cancer in the 12th house which indicates that she the, her destiny is leading her to a position where she will be a bit more hidden there's going to be something about her that remains um something about her image and, and the way something about her career so to speak so the sun is about our most public most uh, accessible identity the kind of identity that we show to everyone uh, not to our most personal relationships not to the people who know about how we plan to strategize and build our lives but more you know the more conventional self that everybody would know and there's this is uh, hidden in the 12th house so there's something about her that's that's not that's really going to remain a bit secretive that is going to be kept as a secret notice also how she has saturn and pluto close together in her first house and close to her ascendant so she's leo rising which is pretty similar to charles's chart 
and that indicates that basically when you see her you pretty much get that vibe that she was just born to be um, just this kind of like carrying yourself as a royalty kind of comes naturally to her you, it would be easy to look at her and be like oh yeah she's like she's like born queen like there's nothing about leo risings that would come across as just an ordinary person from the crowd like they 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 stand out they have the manners that say oh i stand out from the crowd like i'm more special even if nobody particularly knows why you, you you're special pluto is also there which indicates intensity but it also indicates that there's going to be some power struggle but also sensitivity to power struggles this is somebody who understands the the darker more plutonian side of life and most importantly, probably, this is somebody who comes across as somebody who understands uh, that life, the huge part of life is about what's going under the surface and about um, how power is distributed in just in personal relationships. This is a very different energy from somebody who would be outgoing, expansive, um, extroverted, which is pretty much what Diana's energy was. Camilla has Pluto, has Saturn, which is restriction, maturity, being grown up, acting like the adult, being a bit um, older than your age, I would say. This is someone who feels comfortable with restrictions and limitations. Somebody who understands that for the sake of leaving a legacy behind, you need to put up with inconveniences. This is somebody who knows how to postpone immediate gratification, life here and now, for the sake of what you're going to build over time. Diana, by comparison, is just Sagittarius rising. Life is here now. It's, this is a fire sign. There's nothing beyond the here and now. If you want to do it, do it. You know, live life with the full energy. Just take a deep breath. Really, really experience the, the power of the moment that you are here and you are alive. This is a very different energy from mature, stable, grounded Saturn. And also with that sun and moon in the 12th house, this is somebody who feels more comfortable behind the scenes. Precisely the kind of wife you would want if you are a king. Like you want a wife that's not more famous than you are and again there's that sensitivity to power and how power is distributed in relationships and so they both have that in the first house they're they, they're both sensitive about that and and considering that um she has sun and moon in a hidden 12th house and then saturn on the ascendant this is somebody who would handle much better all the restrictions uh and the lack of visibility the lack of your own voice that comes with be being part of, of a royal institution. You look at Diana and you see that she has a son in Cancer and then uh, this son is trining Neptune, which is a planet that is associated with humanitarian pursuits, with feeling compassion for people who are disadvantaged. And then Cancer's son is, again, softness, vulnerability, care for other people. And then uh, the ruler of her chart, Jupiter, is also making contact with Neptune. So there's again that strengthened element of compassion for people, just love for humankind all over the world. And that's really sweet and soft. But this is really the sun kind of surface level of, of somebody's identity. When, when it comes to, to personal deep soulmate connections, we cannot disregard the moon. And when the moon is airy, it's intellectual, it's cold, it's detached, it's related to mental compatibility, mental stimulation, conversations. It's, um, it, it's one, that one that needs to feel free. This is a bit hard to combine and to, uh, to align to more Scorpionic, Plutonian, Saturnian energy. On face, just at face value, she might have come across as being the perfect match for, for the role of, of a princess, of a queen, and also a good match for him because Scorpios are very often attracted to cancer people. But 
as you go deeper into the way she feels, the, the way that her psyche works, you realize that, that deep down she wants to align her life with different values and different lifestyle and uh, what she needs to build emotional closeness is really very different from what he needs. She needs communication, conversations, ideas, but also she... Air signs like to stay away from emotional intensity. And then when you're Charles with Sun in Scorpio and then Pluto close to the Ascendant, then intensity is all you, you want, all you need. And while Diana would be, would value, would want, would need freedom, which is um, really what, what um, Aquarius is about, and Uranus, which is um, opposing her moon, then how does that filter in? How does that play out when you have a man who is really sensitive about power struggles and about who has the power, who has the control, I mentioned earlier that for Scorpios, relationships are vulnerability and they hate vulnerability, but they need the relationship. And so they feel like they're just stuck in this catch-22 where you don't want to be vulnerable, but you want a relationship and relationship is vulnerability. And so how do you, how do you build your life to satisfy these two needs? And then having a wife that is, um, first of all, understands your Plutonian power issues power um, concerns and then somebody who is really really comfortable living in the shadow uh, being hidden first as a mistress and then for a very long time just living really far away from from the spotlight somebody who does not want to go out into the world at large which is what what a 12th house um, sun and just this pile up that she has in there this is what it means and then by comparison you have diana with Sagittarius, expansive um, energy on the, on the Ascendant. And then we also have Jupiter, her chart ruler, in the third house of travel and communication. This is a whole new different story. And while they are both Cancer and they all, uh, they both come across as being w what a Scorpio would be attracted to, it's the deeper story that really matters. So what is the sun sign and what is, um, I'm sorry, not the sun sign, but what's the moon sign and what's the story that's going on in this person's psychology underneath the first level compatibility. On level one, the, the most surface level, yes, Diana and, and Camille are both Cancer sons, so they would both fit well with a Scorpio man. But what's the deeper story? What's the deeper, the, the deeper dynamic of their own emotional needs and the way that they want to structure their lives? Remember also that um, Camilla is Leo rising and Leo is ruled by the sun and the sun is in the 12th house. And then she is Cancer's sun. Cancer is ruled by the moon and the moon is also in the 12th house. So there is a lot of... Uh, hidden energy about her a lot of indicators that she feels okay being hidden being invisible and saturn in the first house is usually about some sort of um, restrictions limitations delays when it comes to you individuating and saturn is the ruler of her sixth and her seventh house of um health co-workers and also personal one-on-one -on -one relationships and marriages so there's this indicator that there's going to be something about her personal connections that's going to place limitations on her and the question is well will she be okay with this or will she fight back well i guess the 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 answer to that question is it depends on what kind of restrictions and what kind of limitations those would be. Because with the sun in the 12th house and the moon there, there are certain limitations, let's say limitations when it comes to visibility, that she, she's pretty well suited to handle. And then notice that Jupiter in the 4th house in Scorpio, um, which is hitting a square to Saturn and Pluto in her first house, close to her ascendant. That so Jupiter is the great benefic. It is in her fourth house of home and family, which indicates that she will be blessed in some way. 
when it comes to home and family. And then the fact that this, the great benefic, a planet of good fortune and good luck, is making a contact to that Pluto and that Saturn in her first house indicates, this is one good indicator that all of these Plutonian, Saturnian um, first house issues might actually be handled well. Like their consequences, the way that these Saturnian restrictions or Plutonian power struggles are perceived or the way that they play out will be fortunate. Either um, somehow they are going to benefit the um, her home and family uh, life or the other way around luck and abundance from her home and family life is going to mitigate the uh, restrictions and power struggles um, with regards to her identity the energy and the connection goes both ways and lastly for Camilla I want to touch on um, Uranus and Mars in her 11th house so the 11th house is known for being the place of dreams and the place of um, social networks and having Mars there could indicate that um, at some point on some level you're not going to be perceived very well or that there's going to be a, an accident when it comes to to people liking you meaning that there's going to be a brief period brief is a keyword here because Mars is quick energy unlike Saturn which is more um, consistent in, in long-term uh, malefic energy. Mars is about something brief and it could be severe but, but it's brief and so there's this element of brief conflict, brief negativity when it comes to uh, your social circle, circles. I mentioned earlier that in the case of Charles this 11th house social networks is about the aristocratic um, um, just background that he has and all of these other people that that have traditionally been linked to the royal family and that continue to constitute um, his social circle and because I think Camilla also comes from aristocratic circles so for her even before um, she became um, a member of the royal family I would assume that that was her social circle as well even before that and with Mars and Uranus there there is an indication of brief conflict or brief negative malefic energy and then there is a reversal interestingly the reversal comes after uh, that accident or that brief negativity so when planets uh, continue to move along the zodiac they are going to activate um, the planets in that same order they're first going to activate the Mars which is negative accident the lesser malefic then there's going to be the Uranian reversal and then there's going to be an activation of all her cancer 12th house placements and then as we go along there's going to be an activation of her ascendant her Saturn and then Pluto and that speaking of that um, well her ascendant her Saturn and her Pluto in her Leo first house are going to be activated pretty powerfully pretty soon when um, just in less than what three months um, Pluto will enter Aquarius so it will enter her seventh house of partnerships and it's going to shed its transformative catharsic light on her and Charles's first house and ascendant they have they're both uh, they both have their ascendants in early early Leo um, and then Pluto is also there so uh, it seems like whatever is hitting them will be hitting them both pretty much at the same time um, do let me know in the comments down below if you want me to do a video um, on um, how future transits are likely to impact them because this video is only about just the psychology of why Camilla even though kind of like the general public likes her less and thinks she's not as cool as Diana is actually ended up being a better suit for him so this was the focus of this video but um, yeah in the future um, I might take a deep dive into um, 
what the future might hold for them, let me know if uh, you want to see that. Um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I hope you learned something from it, not necessarily about the three of them, but also about your own personal life and about uh, maybe why a relationship you thought was going to work didn't work. Maybe in your own life you met somebody that um, on first glance looked like they would be a perfect match, but then things didn't work out and you keep wondering why. And I hope that this video somehow helped you to uh, find the answer and uh, hopefully to learn something about the way to build better relationships in the future. Um, thank you for being part of this um, mini online event and um, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!